Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, first ever episode of Medical Myths. And this is just a special live stream that I plan on doing as often as I can, probably around this same time every week, where we talk about weird uh, myths and misconceptions. Myths, I cannot talk. Myths and <laughs> misconceptions in uh, medical related topics. And I want to bring on guests to talk about these with me, just things that I find online that I think are cringy that deserve talking about. And I actually found this article, uh, it, it was published on August 4th of this year uh, by Answers in Genesis talking about Lyme disease. And I was intrigued because I want to talk about Lyme disease, but there's a lot that goes into Lyme disease that relates to entomology and tick ecology. So I needed to bring in somebody who can help me out with that side of it. So here we have Brainbug here with me today to talk about um, Lyme disease. Hey, uh, yeah. So yeah, Torben, uh, he sent me this article and uh, I'd seen a lot of things by AIG and a lot of claims, especially made about bugs. I didn't actually have this one on my back catalog. So this was all coming at me fresh and uh I mis messaged him back and said, I'm just mashing my face into the, <laughs> into the keyboard of <laughs> reading this article. Uh, there's so much uh, misinformation about Exodes and uh, about uh, the Brucella. I'm saying that right, Brucella? Uh, uh, Brucella is uh, Borrelia is this one. Brucella Bor Borrelia, okay, yeah. yeah. So, Brucella is another disease. That's what we were talking about. Also before. a zoonotic disease, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about that before, uh, before we came on camera, so I got mixed up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, student Dr. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about nerd stuff all the time, <laughs> even before we go live. Um, oh. But yeah, uh, this is very cringy. If if any of you have ever read an article by Answers in Genesis, uh, it's it's hard to get through. So luckily, you don't have to go through it alone because we're going to go through this together and talk about why uh, it doesn't make sense. So let me pull up the article and we can read this together. You mm -hmm. can all see this. Yes. I can see it. Yep. Okay. So I guess first impressions that I had, and I'm guessing like we've talked about this before, you had similar first impressions. The fact that this is formatted very much like a research article would be. Mm -hmm. yep, is like this a research would... article? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is set up like like something you would do at nature, like you'd find it nature or science. Obviously, if you look into it, and the, the format is just a, a farce. If you get down into it, there's no, there's no actual research in here. It's uh, there's there's no reason for there to be an abstract. The abstract should be what they're calling an abstract here is just a summary of what they put down below, and it's just all assertions. What bothers me about this is uh, uh, we got Dr. Alan Gillen, and if you if you look. He's a biologist. He's got a biology degree, so he knows better than than to present a paper like this. Yeah, uh, it, it's pretty terrible, and it says that it's it's featured in an answers in depth. So, like, they have certain articles on their website that are supposed to be like more in depth articles. Um, but as we go through, you all will notice that there's really not any depth to this like they list a few facts and uh, i guess it's more in depth than you'd get in a homeschool level of education on biology so people can think it's in depth but there's no in-depth content there's a lot in here that they miss a lot of nuance with lyme disease that they miss and we're going to expose those holes as we go through and to be fair, there's a there's about two paragraphs worth of uh, of their original thoughts in here, and the rest of it is all uh, pilfered from like CDC research and stuff like that, and kind of twisted. As that's another thing we're going to pick apart and pick up on as we move forward. Yeah, so I guess let's. Uh, I'll start reading this. Uh, so the title is "The Origin of Ticks and the Genesis and Emergence of Lyme Disease," and their little. Uh, thing here is this tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease have plagued humans for millennia. Did God make them that way? And what do they teach us about a fallen creation? So we already have bias being introduced here. Uh, we yeah. already have them trying to make an assertion that this is somehow related to creation. Right. And, it, it, and it's there's creation set down in the first paragraph, 
they're they're saying we're we're already preconceiving that the world is created and that all life was created uh I guess by Behrman's is what AIG uses, right? Behrmanology. Anyway, yeah. So weird. I'm so confused. So they're abstract. And I'm going to use quotes for all these because, yeah, this is not an abstract. They say, ticks are notorious for their capability of transmitting diseases that have debilitated humanity for thousands of years. They can confer lifelong chronic ailments via pa pathogenic bacterial species that they harbor inside themselves. These parasitic tick species, namely the Ixodes scapularis tick, is responsible for hundreds and th of thousands of Lyme disease infections each year. This profound tick continues to produce the highest rate of zoonotic disease in the United States each year. Many may ask why these tick species are so infectious when the ticks were originally designed by a benevolent god. Uh, why would a good creator choose to design a creature ultimately capable of such considerable virulence? What accounts for the continued resurgence of Lyme disease? There are many contributing factors that help to resolve this complex question, such as its relative displacement and the many compounding mutations on the species itself that attributes to the overall pathogenicity that in turn may violate its original design. One of the primary goals of this article is to elaborate on the early ancestry of these ticks that eventually give way to the development of critically invasive infections such as Lyme disease. All right, this is already a lot to deal with. Yeah, there's a whole <laughs> mess of, uh, well, first of all, let's talk about what an abstract should do. An abstract should tell you uh, basically what the research is about, uh, what uh, what their hypothesis for the conclusion for the conclusion is going to be. It should be stated in there that this is what we're researching. This is what we think we're going to find. This is how we are going to look for it. And, and get an outline of that that's fairly fairly simple and straightforward, but not it doesn't necessarily have to be accessible to lay people because it's meant to be read on a professional level. So that's what an abstract should do. It's not a summary of what uh, uh, of what the whole paper is about. An abstract is uh, is an outline of what the project is. Yep. And, and again, we're already getting into a lot of bias here. Um, we're getting into the problem of evil. Like this, this weird article is already like it's setting up the problem of evil just now with regard to ticks. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to talk about tick mouth parts here later on. It's going to work uh, because there's some claims made about evolution, actually. And it, it, it's, it's ironic. Wait till we get there. You all will love it. Okay. Uh, in this paragraph, though, uh, about the, Lyme disease being a problem in the in the Northeast, there's a lot of ecological re reasons for that that we can we can trace directly, and we don't we don't need to evoke any kind of supernatural element to understand why Lyme disease is impacting the regions that it impacts. We it's it's all the way that the the that the uh, Borrelia is passed on through the through the tick and through uh, its competent host. We're not a competent host, and when they get to us. They're, they're SOL, but by the time that they're in a human, you know, are, are, uh, they're, they're at a dead end and we, our immune system is going to, uh, go nuts, but we don't have to evoke a God to understand why humans are being more impacted now in those regions. It's all due to, uh, as I was talking to someone about snakes earlier, the extirpation of, uh, of rodent predators like the eastern diamondback rattlesnake in the area, uh, other rodent predators too, as well being marginalized, owls, uh, different uh, mustelids like weasels, those kind of things, all are impacting the reason why this disease is so rampant. They're going to make a lot of claims moving forward about this as well. And something that I'm going to touch on now that's going to get more apparent later as well uh, is that they seem to be confusing some definitions uh, with like the, the tick is a vector for Borrelia. So the tick is not causing Lyme disease. The tick is innocent. The tick doesn't care. The tick doesn't know what it's doing with Lyme Just disease. The tick, right. the tick is a parasite. Like it is, it is drinking blood. This is true. Uh, but that's like the tick itself is not causing Lyme disease. The, the Borrelia is 
a microorganism that is causing the Lyme disease. But the, and again here, the Borrelia is not Lyme disease. The Borrelia is just doing its thing. It's just living. It's trying to uh, survive and reproduce. That's their goal. Like they have an existence of their own. And Lyme disease is a result of them just doing what they do. Yeah. So like the tick is not the disease, the, the organism, the microorganism isn't necessarily the disease either. The disease is a result of our interaction with the way that Borrelia exists uh, in the body. Yeah. The Borrelia is not happy about being in a human either. It doesn't, there's no benefit for the Borrelia being inside a human. It can't, it can't propagate. It's yeah. It's a dead end for them. And, uh, and, then our then they spend the rest of their little Borrelia lives uh, being attacked by our immune system. Now it's a fruitless little attack. Borrelia. Yeah. Borrelia are just misunderstood. Yep, just poor little <laughs> misunderstood uh, spirochetes. <laughs> yep. Let's uh, let's go into this. Oh, I, this is where it starts getting super cringy. Also, you can get a free trial to Answers TV if you ever <laughs> want to. <laughs> if somebody wants to buy me that. I will, or to uh, to pay for like a, a year's subscription, I can get all kinds of content out of that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be so bad. I, I would, don't even want it on my TV, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want it either. I don't want to give them money. <laughs> but uh, the introduction. So again, formatting this like a, an academic paper. Mm -hmm. uh, Tick-borne diseases are very common and have spread across the USA during the summers for at least forty years. They are now quite abundant in Virginia and Pennsylvania and have spread to the West Coast, Northern California this summer. Although COVID-19 gets most of the news, there can be overlap of symptoms of COVID-19 and Lyme disease. In addition to Lyme disease, the number one zoonotic disease in the USA, other common tick-borne illnesses include spotted fever, rickettsiosis, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, typhus, ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, alpha gall, and many more. Uh, let's just attack this and then we'll we can do the next paragraph first i gotta compliment you rolling through those names like a boss that was not an easy <laughs> list of, of, uh, of binomial nomenclature <laughs> i've studied i've studied these specific ones enough to have had like to uh, say their names over and so over again this claim about them being this being uh similar to uh covid19 and being mistaken for it is that actually a thing that's happening no no, no, it is not. <laughs> this is like n not so subtle. Uh, COVID nineteen, like I, I guess it's not really like denialism, but it's just, it's very passive aggressively saying that we shouldn't care about COVID nineteen because well, but what if we misdiagnosed Lyme disease because we called it COVID, and they do this again later on. Um, but this is not something that happens. Lyme disease has a very characteristic presentation uh, and also Lyme disease does not show up with a positive COVID test. Uh, you can pretty easily screen for, uh, is it COVID or is it not? And that's not to say someone can't have Lyme disease and COVID, but uh, you can have both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only symptoms I can think of that would be similar would be body aches, but the, Lyme disease is what that's you're usually what six to eight weeks into it before you start getting body aches there. Right. Yeah. Uh, Lyme has a very characteristic progression. Uh, and, and I can go into that. There's a point when they talk about the stages of Lyme disease and mm -hmm. I can go more in depth on that in a little bit, but it it's yeah, there, there's very distinct presentations. And also I don't understand why we needed to talk about COVID at all in this article about Lyme disease. They're not at all related illnesses. So I don't like the only reason I could see that they would include this is to be passive aggressive about it, which is what they've done here. Uh, well, I'm going to say this just real quick. I, I did a stream this morning where we were, where I was looking at a, uh, a conservapedia article about snakes and there was a section about COVID-19 in it. There, the, the, this, this conservative Christian fundamentalist mindset, they need to connect everything. All the things that they don't like have to be connected together uh, yeah. in, 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 in this network. So everything that you read on here is going to mention COVID-19 from now on, you know, it's kind of crazy. 
Yeah, it's a little stupid. Anything else mm -hmm. about this paragraph before we move on? Let me see here. Um, the spread thing is is not uh, not wrong, and it is a, a real issue. And you know, it's being closely monitored by the CDC. But the reason a lot of this is due to extirpation of uh, of these meso predators. So, you know, we're kind of reaping what we sow there um, with how these disease vectors like the uh, like the what's the white footed mouse uh, why they are so getting so close to us now because we wiped out their predators. But that's yeah, that's it. That's all I got to say on that one. Yeah, and um, I, I will add, and this is an, another thing that shows up later, is there are different strains of Borrelia as well. And so you do see similar illnesses to Lyme um, in like Minnesota and places. It's not technically like the exact same thing, but I think the presentation's very similar. Um, it might even be classified as Lyme, but just a different Borrelia species or subspecies and they talk um, about that later on in here too yeah they um, do and we'll get into that because they missed uh quite a few things on that uh this okay so this next paragraph and we're getting into the the mice thing so lyme disease has been under surveillance of the cdc since 1982 most of the cases are reported in the northeastern uh, usa many states seem to have the disease under control however in pennsylvania uh the cases keep increasing the most recent annual CDC report in 2019 summarized 6,763 confirmed and another 2,235 probable cases or about 9,000 new cases per year, uh, according to the CDC in 2021 in Pennsylvania. Listening to the local Pittsburgh news this year, the numbers, the number keeps rising. The number keep rising. This is a great little typo. Uh, in the post-pandemic er era, the most likely reason is popular outdoor activities in the area, such as hunting, fishing, and camping. Both forest edge habitants and farms seem to be locations for picking up deer ticks. Outdoor recreation has increased in 2021 following lowered COVID-19 restrictions. Yeah, um, and again, these are these are things that are strongly tied to other ecological changes that have taken place over the last uh, five years or so. And a lot of uh, uh, damage to the environment that's uh, that's fairly irreversible uh, that, that that comes into play with all of this stuff. And this is just one of many many uh, uh, side effects of are us damaging the uh, the ecology of an area that we're going to see more and i say this about uh about covid too because it's also the result of you know decades and decades of us altering and uh, and damaging the uh, environment that we live in and what happens when you do that how how microorganisms that evolve so quickly how how fast they can they can adapt to this new world that we're creating and become just our worst enemy every single time. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts about the fact that they're citing the CDC on this? Um, yeah. Go to the CDC instead of going to AIG for, for your <laughs> Lyme disease information. I am. I, and that's the one thing I did. I did mention when I was uh, messaging with, with Torben too, was that, uh, <laughs> Man, uh, at least they put links to the actual CDC on the on this website. I know they're doing it just to try to to uh, fake legitimacy, but at least the homeschool children that are accessing these AIG websites will have something real. But can we trust the CDC about like because we if we can trust the CDC about Lyme, why can't we trust them about COVID? Like this right. seems to be like. Oh yeah, there's there's what is more, their standard for trusting the CDC? There's more irony uh, with who the what information they're willing to trust and reference coming up. So we got plenty of that. Uh, when, uh, when when they cite papers and stuff in here, it gets pretty hilarious. Yeah, uh, I'll you know, read this. this. Oh, okay. I can. Oh uh, yeah, we can switch off for the next one, I guess. Uh, in Virginia, we have observed more college students contracting Lyme disease at Liberty University. Of course. Of course, it's Liberty University. Always is. Uh, deer are increasing in numbers locally and acorns from oak trees, which they're specifying as if nobody knows where acorns come from, have been <laughs> observed in record numbers locally. Acorns are the primary food for white-footed mice. 
Uh, white-footed mice are the principal natural reservoirs for Lyme disease bacteria. Greater acorns, mice, and ticks transfer the bacteria to deer and then people. With the abundance of deer and ticks, no wonder tick bites are reported in higher numbers as people look to get outdoors in the post-pandemic era. This is not the post-pandemic era. Post Stop, it. Stop it. Yeah. And that's right there. It just shows you the, uh, the veracity of the claims that they're willing to make here. We are not post pandemic. We are right in the, in the mix of it. We're actually at the, at the top of a new spike, the highest, this, that I believe this is the, the highest spike that we've been at, isn't it? Uh, probably. I don't know the actual stats on that. Yeah. But, uh, regardless, yeah, we're not, uh, post pandemic and, uh, the, Predators of the white-footed mice, the predators of the deer, those are all things that are coming into play here that we wipe out because of their, because we spent decades with this campaign to wipe all these predators out because of their effects on livestock. Okay. And, and that's, that's not unfounded that, they, you know, that, that cougars and bears and wolves, uh, not to mention the miso predators, the coyotes, the, the bobcats and lynx, uh, I could go on badgers, all these different animals that, that used to be, you know, th spread throughout the North, North America are now marginalized mostly into the Western States, but they're, excuse me, <clears throat> COVID throat for that matter, but they're, they're prey items. When uh, you take the, the predators away, uh, they just, they just explode. Their numbers explode. Uh, we saw in 2018, the, the, it was, keep referring back to this because it's fresh in my mind, but the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake was declared extinct in uh, Connecticut. Now we're looking at lime levels in Connecticut just skyrocketing because there's nothing eating out there eating those mice. It's all, all interconnected. Yeah. Yeah. This is about to get even more interesting as well because they're about to start trying to teach us some science about with, ticks with gospel quotes too with, with gospel quotes yeah they have bible verses in here so get your bibles out everyone yeah follow so we're along gonna, we're gonna read the bible like, so, the, which, like, like your audience doesn't already have their bibles right there what do you what oh do you yeah say? i'm sure i still have my communion crackers <laughs> right here do not okay this is my warning my one warning to everybody do not pour wine on these and eat them like cereal it's nasty, and we figured out why. It is because uh, there's like baking powder or something in here because there it's not leavened, right? So like you can use baking powder and it won't rise technically. Uh, but you put this in wine, and it has like some reaction, and it tastes nasty. Like it's so gross. Yeah. So don't do. So it. no 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 Jesus soup with communion wine and. Can yeah, we know. tried. It was really disgusting. Um, but anyway, besides that little sidetrack, uh, do you want to read? This yeah, let me read. Section? Let me read figure one here. Okay, which which came first? Uh, ticks are notorious for the disease that cause or disease they cause. And then we quote Genesis one thirty one says that God made everything very good. But if everything that God made was good, where did disease causing ticks come from? What is the origin of ticks? In a very good creation, where do ticks fit in? Why did Lyme disease originate? Creation <laughs> Creation biologists. I, I couldn't even oh, get it God. out. Creation biologists have been asking such questions, Gillian 2020, which is the person who wrote this article, so he's citing himself, uh, and more is needed to understand uh, the good purpose of ticks and why new diseases are popping up. Tick figure one. Uh, that's just the same thing there. It's just about it being very good. My, uh, my idea of very good is sustainable. Uh, in the creation model, when there were no, when there was no predation, no interspecies uh, conflicts, there was no food web. There could not have been a food web. A food web does not function without, predator prey relationship you can't have detrophores the entire fungus kingdom is out the window because nothing is decaying uh for them to break down the, i'm assuming everything is supposed to eat the fruits of plants in this model so i guess that that, that to that extent there's sort of a food web but 
that doesn't explain the diversity we see in the animal kingdom. My idea of very good is a well-balanced web of life that keeps it, that sustains all the organisms that are within it. So very good is, is not the creation model in my opinion. Yeah. I, I honestly, like, I don't understand. I mean, I, I do understand that we run into the problem of evil in uh, creation and, and, stuff like they do have a lot to answer for with um these diseases so of course they're going to come up with weird stuff like this but they're not answering their own question and they won't really ever answer their own questions because they they literally just be like this is how it is because god now this is looking more like a uh like a chapter caption from a homeschooling book the quite the way that they're like why did this yes. why is that that's not something you would see in a real science scientific paper either at least not formatted like that it would be like we set out to understand uh where the, the disease causing ticks come from it wouldn't just be where did disease causing kicks ticks come from as i would say we you know we set uh traps here and there uh to there, there would be all sorts of there, there would be actual science with this stuff there would be we would be looking at collection sites and we were looking at, uh, at uh, just a schematic of which ones were vectors. And it, it, there, there would be so much more than just a picture of a tick on some grass and then questions like, where did they come from? How are they good? How are ticks good? Everything that God created had to be good at some point, which is where we're going to get to the mouth parts. But let's let's move on to the next chapter. <laughs> yeah. And all, also, this is not a hypothesis that they're setting up. Like this is already riddled, riddled with bias because they're starting with assumptions of God. They're starting with assumptions that uh, ticks are bad because they're saying in a very good creation, where do ticks fit in? Like they're already starting with an assumption that ticks are negative. Um, ticks are just living their tick life. They're same as you you eating your mm -hmm. hamburger and 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 drinking your milk or whatever. It's 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 all an animal and organism consuming the, the resources that it's evolved to consume and reproducing N nothing nefarious in a tick. It's not an evil organism. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a picture here of a lovely Ixodes tick and uh, it's adorable. Look at how cute it is. Yeah. It's little but, pinchy mouth parts. Yeah. Oh, I no, guess we can read the next part or did you want to say anything about the picture itself? No, it's that's, that's I mean, it's a tick. <laughs> basically what I, what I what you'd expect to, to see on an AIG is just a picture of the organism. No, when you got when you got some figure one, figure one should have more significance in the actual paper. It should show uh, in the paper that's talking about something like this subject. It should show uh, collection sites first. But mm -hmm. I digress. We we don't have any maps, so we yeah, don't think we actually did any collection or any actual research. <laughs> This next paragraph is fun, and I actually do have some comments on this next paragraph as well. Um, so we're talking about mites now, <laughs> which are not ticks. Um, but mites are tiny eight-legged animals that share a common anatomy with ticks. We believe they give clues to pre-fall functions and purposes for ticks on Earth as decomposers. Although mites and ticks may be in different baromens, is that the, the kinds? Is that what yes. he means? Barrowmen okay. are kinds. Okay, that weird. Their functions in the ecosystem may parallel one another and may, might provide clues to their original very good purpose. More research on this topic is needed. Yeah, that's one very true thing that they've said is that like any of these claims that they're making need more research. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Please do more research. Before, actually, they should have done no more research before they made the claim, but it's not too yeah. late to retract it. So, um, yeah. Real quick, can, would you be able to share my screen? Uh, I just I, I, I've been itching to talk about this and itching because the text. <laughs> okay. Uh, should I, I read the rest of the paragraph and then? Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's, I, I want to talk about mites and ticks and how they they look compared to each other. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, paragraph. and I want to talk about mites and ticks as, as well. Yeah. Uh, where where they oh bearmans uh, research um, even though they are quite small mites are important to humans and other animals 
Most species are beneficial decomposers, breaking down organic matter and allowing nutrients to be used by plants again. Ticks are ectoparasites, feeding on the blood of mammals, birds, and sometimes reptiles and amphibians. The timing of the parasitic origin of ticks is uncertain. Most likely, they were decomposers living off dead plant and organic matter, recycling the elements in nature. At some time after Adam's sin and the curse, they lost their ability to extract necessary materials from plant hemoglobin and started depending on animal blood. All female ticks need animal blood to make eggs. Many male ticks exist merely to mate and do not necessarily feed on animals. And here, I'll stop sharing so that you can... Oh, yeah, I wanted to just just to share the uh, the difference in the, the way a tick's mouth looks compared to a... Compared to a mite. So here's a tick's mouth. Here we go. Okay. Um, so when we were looking at that picture of the one on the grass, it was looking at it from the top. So they got these these two folds that come down. These open kind of like a uh, like a wine bottle opener, um, where you where it pops out. So it pops out, and then this this thing uh, holds the, the what they see the the backward uh, barbs here. Uh, they hold the flesh open and kind of do the scissor motion to cut into it. So these, this is about essentially like a meat knife in, in the mouth of the, uh, of the tick. And once it cuts that, it cuts into there and the, the blood pools and it has a little spoon like organ that, that comes out and kind of laps it up. But their mouths are, are meat cutting. This is the same kind of thing with uh, the, the, the melon eating Tyrannosaurus. Uh, organisms with, with sharp teeth, we can tell what their what their diet is. Teeth are so diagnostic to what an animal ate and how it lived. Uh, it's it's ridiculous to claim that this was ever performing any function other than uh, than, than cutting into flesh. Because we look at a, a mite's mouth parts, they're very simple, uh, and this is the same kind of thing you would see in a. Uh, in a uh, harvestman, a very simple detrivore mouth. It drops down. It picks up, uh, picks or kind of snuffles through the uh, the waste on the on the forest floor and picks out the nutrients that it wants to consume. So very generalist browsing mouth here. Very very specialized meat cutting, blood drinking mouth right here. And there's no doubt about that. That that's what that mouth what that mouth is. For what all ticks' mouths have been for, and we have ticks in amber with mouths that are for this. It's it's not something novel that uh, that has evolved in recent decades to to diverge from mites. The funny thing about this is is that uh, AIG, I believe, that they put mites and ticks into separate barrens. So for them to say these two organisms both fill the same niche, so we can look at this one and this one, and understand that this one's mouth used to be like this one's mouth. No, you can't. And there's no indication of that, at least not within the time frame that they're talking about, which is what, 6,000 years, right? Also, it's it's kind of laughable that they're saying that mites are just the beneficial form of ticks and that ticks, if ticks were good, then they'd be like mites. But they're ignoring the fact that mites also carry diseases. Mites also transmit diseases to humans, uh, namely scrub typhus and rickettsial pox, which are very similar to diseases that are caused uh, by ticks uh, that spread disease. So um, they're very similar in that. So, I mean, if they're saying that ticks are bad because they spread disease, then mites would also have to be bad because they spread disease. Well, in every animal along the chain, of spreading that Lyme disease to the ticks, just the last one to, to, to pass it to you. It's by the time that you get it, it's already been through uh, one tick, a rodent, a second uh, competent host, and then finally to you. So every, if, whether it's a deer, a mouse, if you're saying the tick is bad, all of the organisms along that chain are bad. Yeah. Uh, so they're just inconsistent in, in their, um, and their definitions here of what is good and what is bad. And uh, I apologize, normie words. Um, scrub typhus and rickettsial pox, you don't really need to know what those are. Just know that they're diseases caused by 
um, bacteria carried by mites. Uh, it, I think rickettsiopox, of course, is a rash. I think typhus, well, I most types of typhus do have a rash. Uh, the vector is in their frass, though, right? In the, the, the molts of the mites when they, for the rash, right? Probably. I don't actually know a whole oh. lot of okay. specifics on that. I just know that they carry them. <laughs> uh, what else do we need to normie word? Um, that's those were the those were the only big words that I that I got. If there's any words that either that we've said, uh, say huh, and we'll we'll try to clarify. We were just talking yeah, about we'll, that before. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I need to get better about um, communicating yeah, in English. If I'm gonna bring something up, I should I should source it before I start talking about it because I don't like saying when someone's like, oh well, what's that? And you're like, I don't know. It's like, oh man, I should have. But that's all right. We live and learn. So sorry if I if I uh, didn't explain anything in a, in any any way that you could understand. Not um, to you, I'm sure, sure you understood everything. <laughs> anything else about mites before we move on to the next um, section? Well, I mean, mites are arachnids, and they do carry some of the same uh, pathogens, and uh, and they do. Again, I believe uh, that the diseases that are caused the skin the skin irritation diseases that are caused by mites are caused by when they when they molt and leave their dead exoskeleton with the pathogens on the skin. But I'm not 100 percent sure on that for the diseases that you mentioned, so I'm not going to quote that directly. All but right. yeah, mites carry diseases too. So, oh, everything's bad. Yeah, everything's bad in the in the ecosystem if it leads to people getting Lyme disease. So, yep. <sighs> All right. So now we're going to talk about what good are ticks. Like most living things, ticks serve a purpose in the balance of the ecosystem and have a role in the animal kingdom. They provide food for other animals. Ticks may feed on a lot of mammals but they often become a meal themselves. Many animals eat ticks, including reptiles and birds. Scientists monitor tick populations to assess ecosystems. When ticks are abundant, populations of smaller animals, such as rodents and rabbits, may also be high. A low tick population can indicate that predators may be getting out of control. Everything is interconnected in the animal kingdom. That's about the most accurate thing they've said so far. And th this kind of points to something that they like to do a lot in their rhetoric. They they love to put a, a, the occasional accurate fact so that they seem more trustworthy because it's like, oh, if I can prove that I know something about this, uh, then I can more easily get away with inserting other things that are not as accurate or not as proven. And that's kind of what they're doing with this. They're just giving you enough information to seem credible but then later on, they're just going to overly simplify things to a point that it's incorrect. Yeah, it's like uh, we were saying before, there's a lot of this is just them taking information from like the CDC and putting it together in here and then interlacing comments about creationism and God uh, without throughout it. It's, it's really disingenuous. <laughs> so anything else you want to say about this little section? I know, like we said, this is pretty much... Yeah, so that's just basic ecology uh, on tick-borne disease vectors, and that's what we that's what we find on all of them is that uh, uh, small predator, small small uh, to meso predator populations uh, do generally control the tick population, and and by extension the, the disease vector population. So yeah, that, I, there's no no problem there. Good, AIG you did something right. All right, we have the history of Lyme disease. A team of researchers from the Yale School of Public Health has reported that the Lyme disease bacterium is ancient in North America, circulating silently in forests for at least uh, 60,000 years, long before the disease was first prescribed in, uh, described in Lyme, Connecticut in 1976, and long before the arrival of Europeans in the U.S. Uh, in a biblical timeline. Yeah, because they don't believe in the 60,000 years. There we are. That's what I was going to talk about when you <laughs> In a biblical timeline, this might correspond to a time shortly after Noah's worldwide flood. Wow, this is a long before the disease was first described in Lyme, Connecticut in 1976 by Alan Steer, MD. This early diversity suggests that the recent epidemic of human Lyme disease has been fueled not by, not by adaptive changes in the bacteria, but by ecological change. 
driven by ecosystem disruption from human activities, such as increased deforestation and hunting, and by changes in weather, long-term climate change, which has influenced the movement of lime-hosting birds and mammals, especially deer and white-footed mice. How long did it take to get climate change brought up? We're, we're, we're in the top, still in the top third of the uh, of the article, and we're already talking about climate change. We talked about climate change and COVID in an article about Lyme disease. Yep. Oh. Yeah, oh, this, my goodness. this hurts. Uh, this hurts a lot. Anna asked, uh, wonder if predators can get disease, can get the disease if they're too or they are adapted for it. So predator, it, the, there are predators that can get Lyme disease. Dogs are the second uh, most common uh, study or the most studied uh, carriers of not incompetent host carriers of Lyme disease. Maybe we should clarify what competent and incompetent means. Cause I keep saying that maybe I'm. Yeah. Yeah. So you should a, explain that. A competent host is a host that the disease uh, can grow in, in, in and uh, enter into its next stage of its life cycle in and then exit and then go back and the, the tick feeds from that and it catches it and brings it on to the next host. So an incompetent host is a host where the, the, the disease won't be able to get back out into the ticks and it can't reach. So it can't reproduce. It can't propagate within them. So an incompetent host is a host that can't, they cannot propagate in and then a competent host, they can. Now among the incompetent hosts, there are humans and dogs and I want to say horses that are uh, very uh, uh, sensitive to this to this disease, and our immune system goes nuts when we when we get exposed to it. That's because we're incompetent. the The disease can't move anywhere out of our body, but our uh, our immune system can't fight it. We don't have any any the the way our our immune system is is developed and evolved. There's no way to fight these. And I think it's all spirochetes that we can't we mm -hmm. can't uh, defeat them with our white blood cells. Yeah, and I'll go into that as well once we get oh, to that right. part of the article. Why am I answering that question when <laughs> we get into no, that I, part of it? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, and we'll we'll get into some good detail on that. But that's good information uh, for the audience to know. Um, I'm trying to think of like anything else that I mean. We can obviously see that there's some problems with this paragraph. Um. I think we covered all of it, though. Yeah, the the biggest part of this is the irony of quoting the sixty thousand years, because AIG yeah. doesn't. That's that's ten times the, as old as the AIG accepts that the universe is, is, and uh, so they're willing to cite things like this. It really shows some uh, that that their position is disingenuous. So why would you cite research that shows that the Earth that they this disease is older than you think the Earth is in order to? present a case for this disease being something that was created by God that doesn't support your argument and it makes it actually look weaker. Absolutely. So we have erythema migrans. Mm -hmm. uh, this is seen in stage one of Lyme disease. So the early localized phase of Lyme disease, you get this target rash. Uh, the rash can also appear in different forms. Kind of the most notable is this target rash, but sometimes it might not look like a target. Sometimes it just looks Kind of, kind of red and indistinguishable from other rash types. But if if you're given, like, if you're taking the medical boards and you're given a rash that's like this, it's Lyme disease, and they're not going to present any of the other types, but you can have different rash shapes. Um, this is figure yeah. two. Although I, they, I don't see any reason for them to have included this as figure two because they haven't said anything about erythema migrans or the stages of Lyme disease yet. Yeah, and uh, this so real quick while we're still on this picture, this really uh, the the way that the rash expresses itself is based a lot on on the skin type of the person infected, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. if you had uh, a lighter, fairer skin, you might see the pattern a little bit clearer. But what uh, do you know? What or maybe you're going to go into it in a little bit. I'll I'll wait and see. If not, I'll ask at the end. Uh, do I know what? Oh, I'll, I'll right. ask you at the end if we don't co oh. cover it because it might come. I think it comes up here. Uh, okay, gotcha. All right. Um, so here we have table one, fast facts about ticks and Lyme disease. So let's see if um, any of these are correct or if we need to debunk some of them. So there are approximately uh, 476,000 people diagnosed and treated with Lyme disease each year. 
Uh, most humans are infected via immature ticks called nymphs. Uh, various animals rely on ticks as a source of food. White-tailed deer serve as the definitive host for Ixidia species. Humans serve as the amplifying host for Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, ticks in many instances function as environmental markers for the surrounding animal population. Ticks pre-fall good function or decomposers in the environment based on similar anatomy and ecological niche with mites. The Borrelia bacteria that frequently lead to Lyme disease have non-pathogenic strains even today. So some of these were already mentioned and some of them are going to be mentioned uh, later yeah. on. So those numbers come directly from the CDC, the fourth, uh, 476,000 people. That's directly from the CDC. So I'm going to accept that. But uh, we need to accept yeah. the COVID numbers as well if we're going to accept those, right, AIG? So I'm, yeah. I'm assuming that them yeah. accepting them numbers is them also conceding the COVID numbers. And they even mentioned COVID yeah. before. So it might, and you know it was on their mind and they're thinking, yes, if they're right about, if the CDC is right about Lyme disease, they're right about COVID. So all of you AIG fans who are out there watching Ben's channel, I know you're all out there. Remember, uh, AIG supports the CDC's position on yep. everything. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Um, what, okay. Most humans are infected via immature ticks. Yeah, I think that's true too. I think that's correct as well. Uh, various Number animals three. rely on ticks as food check or as, as food. So chickens do, uh, mm -hmm. as far as domestic species, but they're, you know, wood hens and, uh, I'm pretty sure that, uh, that quails will eat ticks. Uh, guinea hens will eat ticks. Uh, so they are at the bottom of the food chain. Possums eat ticks. Possums are famous for eating ticks and possums are also famous for not being disease vectors because they have such a low body temperature and slow metabolism that the diseases can't take hold in their systems. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so t uh, they're another great uh, control measure for Lyme disease is possums. So leave the possums alone. <laughs> White tailed possums deers. are adorable. Yeah. Especially uh, uh, the, the uh, sugar gliders. Those are adorable. Those are great. Mm -hmm. Did you know they were possums? I, 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 I did not know they were possums. I knew they were marsupials. But I didn't realize that they were in a possum clay, but yeah, they're possums. But are they the same kind? Are they? Are, is there is there a possum kind? Is there a possum barrowman? I don't know. We We're need multiple. to look this up. Yeah, we multiple need to possum barrowmans. So would, yeah. we're accepting point number three as true. Yeah, uh, white-tailed deer serve as the definitive host uh, for exodes. Uh, yeah, generally that's. That's a competent host for them, so that's what they're. What that's the aim, but uh, ticks aren't. The thing is, the 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 goal of the uh, of the Borrelia and the goal of the uh, of the Exodes are not the same. The Exodes just wants to eat. The Borrelia mm -hmm. wants to to uh, to propagate inside the system. So the ticks can bite onto whatever it can bite onto that, that that sounds yummy. If it's a competent host, yay for the Borrelia. If it's not, sucks for everybody involved except for the ticks. So. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, the white tailed deer would be the optimum host, but not necessarily the definitive mm. host. Yep. Um, humans serve as the amplifying host for Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, one of them. Yes. Yeah. Our, it's not the only our, one. Our impact on the environment is definitely a, uh, uh, heavy handed, uh, part of the, of the whole scenario. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm okay with, with that, uh, being the amplifying host. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Ticks in um, many instances yeah. function as environmental markers for their surrounding animal population. Yes, absolutely. It's Ticks pre-fall good <laughs> function. No, this is false. There's nothing about a tick yeah. that indicates that it was ever a detrivore, uh, more likely its ancestors, like the ancestors of all terrestrial ar 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 arthropods, uh, was uh, carnivorous. Uh, all, I believe that all modern or all uh, all arachnids are descendant from scorpions. So technically, all arachnids are scorpions. But that means that their ancestors were predatory, not uh, detrivores. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So we debunked that one. Yeah. And uh, the Borrelia bacteria that frequently lead to Lyme disease have non-pathogenic strains even today. So yeah, Borrelia as a whole, yes. But this is why we have um, like different species of these because we have, uh, I mean, I don't know specifics of non-pathogenic Borrelia, 
Uh, but we have multiple strains of, of Borrelia uh, that cause different types of diseases. So you can't lump all Borrelia into one category and say that, oh, well, because some of them are non-pathogenic, that means that like they would have had another purpose or whatever. God did something and like, and then sin corrupted the Borrelia. Like it's just different Borrelia are like, it's like Borrelia is like a group. Like it's an umbrella of this type of spirochete. And then you have different things that fall under this umbrella of Borrelia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm trying to use like not. <laughs> not the oh, I'm, well, I'm trying to normalize the word clay. <laughs> yeah. Anna mentioned R and raw earlier. So I think at least some of our uh, audience out there should so be familiar with what a clay it. is. A clay okay. is, it means that all the group, everything within the group has the same, an, has a common ancestor. Yep. So there'll be clades yep. within clades. It's called nested cladistics. There we go. So now we can use those terms and, and not worry about it because <laughs> yeah. we've defined them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, in the endoparasites, bacteria or uh, even like an annelid or something, their evolutionary uh, uh, mutation rate is going to be a lot higher because they they develop in isolated within organ within other organisms they develop in isolation and they reproduce in isolation. So, genetic diversity is going to uh, going to fork a lot faster in these isolated populations than it does in a, in a population that, that are able to overlap and interact with each other. So it's not surprising that we see some Borrelia having different uh, uh, effects, different uh, effects as far as causing disease even in, in our species because there's so much variability among endoparasites. Yep. Uh, and, and they, they, highlight the the number of the 476,000 people diagnosed and treated with Lyme disease every year and that's not a shocking number like does I mean yeah that's a lot of people but also like if you looked up numbers for any other disease it's like yeah that's not it's not a huge like super concerning yeah. like yeah we should do something about it like no one the optimum number of people with Lyme disease is zero, but right. for any particular disease, that's not a shocking number. It's definitely not a uh, uh, indicator that we need to spray chemicals into the trees to kill all the arthropods though. That's what a lot of people think the solution to Lyme disease is. And that's just not the right answer. It is a uh, balanced ecology is the right answer. Yes. The answer is possums. Possums. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, on all of Ben's future streams, the answer is going to be possum at the end. So at it's the test, possums. we take the test, it's possums. The answer is possums. Maybe I should do a quiz at the end of my stream. That'd be funny. <laughs> yeah. Do like a little pop quiz about what we learned today. <laughs> so now we're getting into medicine. History. And this is why I'm here. <laughs> it's for the Lyme disease. So in 1975, the health department received hundreds of calls about cases of what appeared to be arthritis in children in Lyme, Connecticut, despite assurance from physicians that arthritis was not infectious. We're, we're not even going to go into septic arthritis, um, <laughs> but that's also a thing. But yeah. these callers were not satisfied. A state epidemic investigation was begun. Public health officials began trying to locate all those who had an, a sudden onset of swelling and pain in the knees or other joints. This old disease seemed to cluster in late spring and summer and last from a week to a few months. Most patients had symptoms and stages, the first one typically beginning with a skin rash. The rash in figure two uh, began as a, a red spot or bump and slowly enlarged. In the second stage, symptoms were influenza-like fatigue, chills, fever, headaches, stick, nef stick neck, joint and muscle pains, and backache, um, joint pain, swelling, and tenderness, usually of a large joint, uh, so the knees, characterized the third stage. These symptoms developed beginning about six months after the rash and slowly disappeared over years. Uh, later, it was found that bacteria injected by an infected tick multiplied and spread across the skin, disseminated into body tissues by the bloodstream and resulted in an immune reaction that caused tissue damage. But in the late seven, uh, 1970s, this disease became known as Lyme disease. Its technical name is Lyme borreliosis. And there's a lot, there's a lot to address here. Um, <laughs> Good. I was wondering if this history section was, was accurate to the way that this happened. Is that a, um, a fairly accurate outline of events? 
I mean, I don't care so much about the history. I just care about their stages of Lyme and how they are categorizing these stages because mm -hmm. um, they're wrong about the timeline for uh, the stages and they're wrong about what happens at each stage. So um, typically, so we have three stages of Lyme disease. The first one is the early localized stage in this uh, last between days and weeks after uh, the in initial infection. And this is where you get your erythema migraines. So your target rash occurs at this stage and you kind of have flu-like symptoms. So fever, muscle aches, uh, that kind of thing, just very nonspecific constitutional symptoms. And um, when I say constitutional symptoms, that just means anything that we would classify as flu-like. So lots of diseases cause those because it is an immune response that causes the fever and the muscle aches, um, which is why we can't necessarily, if we're diagnosing somebody with an illness and they have flu-like symptoms, it's nonspecific. It tells me that you're sick and it tells me that you have an infection most likely, but it, it cannot be used diagnostically beyond that. Um, but then the second stage is uh, it's disseminated and that just means the bacteria has spread to other parts of your body and this occurs over weeks to months and uh there's some things that they don't mention here um but what are they actually saying for the second stage uh second stage they're saying the influenza like fatigue which that happens in first stage usually for most people chills fever headache stiff neck that usually happens a lot of these um happen in the first stage. Those are like the early symptoms that are reported, right? Yeah, this is first stage. Uh, joint joint pain, I think, can start earlier on. I think that more starts in the second stage, so they're right about that one. Uh, but the rash is going to spread for most people because as the bacteria spreads, the rash also might spread. But a couple of things that they don't mention with stage two of Lyme is... Um, that you have cardiovascular complications in stage two, namely uh, heart blocks. So you get an, a, what's called an AV block. And that just means where uh, your nerve conduction in your heart stops for a small part. And it's hard to conduct electricity between different parts of your heart. Um, and that can be very serious. It can lead to arrhythmias uh, and other cardiac issues happen at this stage as well. And also you can get Bell's palsy at this stage. Uh, so that's a um, facial nerve palsy. So if you see someone who's like half of their face just like doesn't work anymore, um, that's Bell's palsy. And that is, it can have other causes as well, but if it's associated with these other symptoms, it's, it's considered disseminated Lyme disease. And then the third stage, is late disseminated. So this is months to years after, and this is also called uh, like post Lyme Borreliosis syndrome. Like if you might just have this for the rest of your life, it might become a, a chronic thing that you just deal with. And you get um, some nervous system manifestations. So like paresthesias is what the feeling of numbness or tingling in like your hands and your feet. Um, and that can happen because you're getting nervous system involvement of uh, Lyme. And then I, I'd have to look into something else a little bit more, but supposedly um, Lyme disease does have an association with B cell lymphomas, um, but that's a late, late complication as well. So there's oh. just a lot of stuff that they're missing here. So. Yeah, it's, it seems to be kind of out of order too. And this is out of order from even what I read just doing tertiary research because I knew I was coming in here to talk about the ticks and you'd have the Lyme disease covered, but I at least wanted to know a little bit about how the disease progresses. And this doesn't match with what I found either. It was, it was first stage was, yeah, like uh, fever-like symptoms and, and stuff. And then uh, the, the second stage was when it started talking about joints and, and swelling and stuff uh, of the joints. So... Uh, yeah, thank you for clarifying that AIG did not do the, this is not a section that uh, AIG is quoting that is actually correct, despite no. having copious links that they've shared below that say otherwise to what's being presented here.
And I wonder if part of this is because they want to draw the connection between Lyme and COVID. Like, I think they want to blur that line for diagnosis and yeah. to say we're inflating out. the COVID numbers. That's what that's the that's the goal of this whole article. Yeah. To say that yes, they're 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 blowing up the COVID numbers. They're not really that bad. Most of it's Lyme disease or some of it's Lyme disease. They've been saying that since the beginning, too. Yeah, so this is a clear attempt at blurring lines between Lyme and COVID. Um, so that's why they left that information out. Um, anything else about this paragraph that we need to address? Uh, no, I think you covered it pretty concisely. Okay. Um, so we have the clustering of cases was most reported in wood, wooded areas along lakes and streams. This suggested that the disease, I cannot speak today. This suggested that the disease was transmitted by an arthropod. It was also found that affected people were more likely to have a household pet than non-pet owners. Pet owners are more likely to encounter ticks. And I don't know why they have another picture of a tick as a figure. How many pictures of ticks do you need? At, like, if you're going to have separate figures, they should be meaningful. Right. If they're not going to uh, be sexual scientific figures, they could have put a doggo here because they're talking about a dog. Right. right. <laughs> they picked up the woods by their pets. Most patients reported that their arthritic symptoms were preceded by an unusual bullseye skin rash that spread mm -hmm. to a six-inch ring. Concurrently, scientists found spirochete bacteria in the guts of many of the ticks sent from Connecticut. The spirochete named Borrelia burgdorferi, which I still love that name, was later determined to be the cause of Lyme disease. The, oh, yeah, the guy who is named after his last name was Bergendorf. So yeah, or yeah. Borg Borgendorfer, right? Yeah. That's yeah. A, uh, someday I'll have a tick named after me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, this... Uh, as far as I know, this is this is pretty accurate. It's just having uh, a dog bringing uh, ticks in from outside uh, definitely is going to be a uh, uh, make your you more likely to be a vector for the disease. I don't think that that's inaccurate, but uh, as far as the history stuff, again, it doesn't really matter. Uh, that's not. Uh, I mean, if they want to teach someone the history of of Lyme disease, that time it's saying they've been talking about a. You know, sending them in and discovering the species and stuff. Yeah, that's not what we're looking at with this article. What we're looking at is a, a whole, this is all smoke and mirrors to make us look like we have real accurate information about the ticks. Now, most of this, or some of the stuff that's COVID is Lyme disease. Again, I, I can't stress that enough. This is all a smoke screen to make it look like the COVID numbers are lower. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, I want to address Titan in the chat. Um, Lone Star Tick Disease is, is a thing. Uh, it's very similar to Lyme, I believe. Um, I think like it, it's something that on our exams, if it's something that looks like Lyme disease and uh, the patient was found in Texas, it's Lone Star. Um, if it's <laughs> in uh, New England, it's Borrelia. Um, but I, I don't remember a whole lot about that. Because I honestly purged that from my memory I, a little bit. I don't know much about the the meat thing. That's kind of interesting. If that's true, that causes reactions when you eat meat. Yeah. So I don't know. I I don't want to talk out my ass about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was I tested know. on it. I purged a lot of information from my micro class. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I think we're good on that chapter. Here's our spy. In case you're wondering what a spiral key looks like and where it gets its name from. It's <laughs> so cute. It's a spiral. Look at and here's more spirochetes. Yep. Those winds are about to infect someone. You can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So Dr. Alan Steer suspected an infectious agent associated with the ticks in, in the Lyme, Connecticut area based on history and epidemiological data. How, why, why can't I pronounce regular words, but I can pronounce long words? Like epidemiological. I like, I don't know what's wrong with me today. <laughs> However, I, I didn't hear not... if you said data or data, though. Did you say data? I say data. Yeah, well, following epidemiological data. Yeah, it has to be data. <laughs> yeah. However, he could not find the pathogen. A few years later, Dr. Willie Bergdorfer, <laughs> that's the name, working in the Rocky Mountain Laboratories in Montana, invented the technique of sniffing tick legs and looking through a microscope at the body juice. <laughs> <laughs> hemolymph. Uh, in the body juice, he consistently saw long spiral bacteria, spirochetes, coming from the black leg ticks, Ixodes scapularis, associated with the people who had arthritic symptoms. 
By 1981, he would prove that these were the bacteria causing Lyme disease. The bacteria Borrelia, Borrelia burgdorferi would be named in his honor. And of course, they have to mention that Dr. William Burgdorfer was an Episcopalian Christian who studied ticks and tick-borne illnesses for most of his 50-year career. His discovery led to the modern medical treatments for Lyme disease. Uh, because being a Christian obviously makes you right. I don't know if I like the hemolith being uh, being in parentheses behind body juices. Hemolith <laughs> is uh, it's more than body juices. It's it, it, it essentially it's it's their it makes up their uh, of arthropods that what what we would equate to blood and uh, saliva. So body fluids, I guess, is okay. But I think they should have just said uh, hemolith and then put. Uh, internal body fluids and parentheses behind it the other way around here. That's, that's just my body opinion. Juice. Body juices. It makes it sound like you don't want to go to a cocktail party at Willy Bergendorfer's. Yeah. Yeah. That just, that, it sounds so gross. Body juices. Yeah, and a lot of this history, I don't really care about. It's not relevant. And that makes about a good portion of this too. If Yeah. Like it doesn't prove anything that like it doesn't, yeah, I think that, they only wanted to mention it to say that he was a Christian and therefore um, because the scientist was a Christian, that he also believed in like all this nonsense but that they're trying to. Not build. considering the fact that the most people who oppose young Earth creationism are Christians, like orders of magnitude more Christians oppose young Earth creationism than atheists do. So, yeah. Uh, sorry, AIG. Here, I'll let you read this next paragraph about white-tailed deer. Okay, in Lyme disease, white-tailed deer are the normal, definitive host, the final host. As they are a host for the tick host, <laughs> as they are a host for the tick host, hence the commonly used name deer tick. This is where the parasite attains sexual maturity and exodes mate. After mating, the female tick produces eggs. The cycle of larva, nymph, and adult continues. Deer rarely experience symptoms of Lyme disease like humans. White-footed mice are the typical reservoir host and serve as a source of infection for humans or another species. Small mice and chipmunks are a, the primary host that keep the Borrelia bacteria going in the woods and the edge of habitat, high grass, across the U.S. and the world. What? Or U.S. and world, I guess, not the world. I don't think that's right. But <laughs> the small mammals are in the reservoir host for ticks, but the high number of ticks in their bacteria in rodents rarely, if ever, cause disease in these small mammals. Oh my gosh, did this was this edited? That doesn't sound that that host for tick host doesn't does that, does that sound right to you? Definitive. Maybe host. they're trying to say that it's the host. Those are the host for the ticks, and the ticks are the host for. Really, I don't know how many host. How many times does it say host in that sentence? Host, host, host. It's not the word's not even making sense. The white-tailed deer are the common, uh, the common uh, host for these ticks, and they are the, a common vector for this uh, for the Borrelia bacteria. Now that said, uh, the again the ticks are not sitting out to attack humans. This is not a, a, a planned assault where they're trying to infect people. It's a ecology out of balance that's causing this and, and deer can uh in certain circumstances uh have symptoms of lyme disease but really really rare i don't believe that it's uh it's been shown to be fatal to them either i don't know i don't again i don't want to talk out of my butt on this stuff either so um when it comes to the deer i know that they that they can have lyme disease but i don't know what the uh what the results of that are um but yeah, when the, the so the tick is hatched from its egg, and it'll uh, it, it's a very very tiny like the end of a, a like a, a lead pencil like the the very tip. It's that that tiny when it, when it's first born, and it'll attach to a rodent usually. Now, when it uh, feeds off that and drops off and it molts out, this is the stage where it could first potentially uh, attach to a human. It's still very very tiny, and this is where the dogs and stuff bring it in, but the ticks, uh, the ticks are going to be looking probably for either mice, chipmunks, or reptiles. They do like lizards just as much as, as uh, rodents. 
uh, when they attach to a lizard, there's really no, uh, no real risk from that. That's why that in the South where there's, there's more lizards in the Southern States, we don't Lyme disease is, is pretty much unheard of in the, in the Southeast. Yeah. Right. I, mean, I don't uh, have much to say about this paragraph because this is, I, yeah. I'm not a veterinarian. So humans are amplifiers mm, that are the human factor. Humans are the amplifying host for Lyme disease. Merriam Webster's defines amplifying host as an organism in which an infectious agent, such as a virus or bacterium, that is pathogenic for some other species is able to replicate rapidly into a high concentration. It is not until the tick attacks and infects humans that the Borrelia bacteria multiplies by the billions. Therefore, humans experience disease that displace the displacement of Borrelia from uh, the natural host is what leads to major disease issues. No. Okay. What do we think, Doc? Um, it well, it's it's a component, like the fact that um the the Borrelia are being amplified is is a component of its um, virulence and its pathogenicity. Uh, however, it really doesn't talk about how Borrelia actually causes Lyme. Just because a bacteria multiplies does not mean it's going to be pathogenic. Like yeah, like the the amplification itself isn't the problem. It's the fact that. Um, Number not one, not specifically uh, pathogenic yeah. anyway. Sorry. Oh. oh yeah, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, the so the issue is your immune response. So Borrelia triggers a massive immune response uh, to it, but then it also has immune evasion. So why it's such a problem uh, is because it cannot be dealt with. Like. Uh, brain bug was saying earlier, it can't be dealt with by our immune system. So it builds up and it causes an immune response because your body knows that like something is going on, but it can't do anything about it. That's um, what the fever is about. Your body's trying to burn the spirochete out. It's not going to work, but it's going to try. Yeah. So that's the, so the cause of the actual disease is um, the virulence factors and the, the, factors that make it pathogenic and that those are not necessarily the fact that that it just amplifies and that it's been displaced from their natural host like i mean yes in being um in being transferred from the deer to a human of course obviously you need it to infect a human to give a human a disease that's true but just because a bacteria is now in a human does not mean it's going to cause a human disease. So that's just also hi, Shannon Q. Love you. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> what thoughts do you have about this? <laughs> uh, yeah. As far as uh, the reason that, yeah, it's, it's your body fighting back against it because it's got an infection, but it's, it can't spread. We're not, we're not uh, spreading this pathogenetically from one human to another. That's just not the way that it, that it works. So we're not like a vector for this disease. We're not, uh, ticks aren't biting us and dropping off and then biting other people and, and infecting them. Generally it's a, it's a one shot thing. The ticks in the environment can carry more, but they're not carrying it more uh, and getting the, the virus from humans and giving it to other humans. That's just not the way that it works. And I think I should clarify about this. So um, the Borrelia does cause Lyme disease, but the fact that your body has the bacteria isn't what's going to cause you to have symptoms or presentation. Uh, it, the bacteria has to do something to your body. It has to interact uh, through immune responses and through immune evasion. And that's what's going to cause the disease. So when we talk about any kind of pathogen, um, we talk about virul virulence factors, which are specific mechanisms that an organism uses to cause disease. And if you don't have any virulence factors, you're not going to have disease. Like we have plenty of bacteria that live inside us and, and on our skin that don't cause disease because they don't have these virulence factors. 
Um, however, some of them might cause uh, disease if you're immunocompromised. So one disease might be able to be cleared by a person with a healthy immune system, but not, might cause a disease in someone without one. So that's just a little clarification on the difference between having a, a bacteria and having a, a disease, if that made any sense at all. Okay. And do they, I don't remember uh, at the end of this article, do they go into the fact that some people just don't have an immune response to the, uh, to the Borrelia and just go on living their normal lives? I don't, that is a thing. I don't think they talk about that. I think they talk about non-pathogenic Borrelia um, species, but they don't, they don't say that. I don't think they mention asymptomatic yeah, carriers it's like, of Lyme. It's over 20%, isn't it? I, I don't know exact numbers, but yeah, there are some people that don't don't get symptoms. Right, doesn't mean they don't get the Lyme disease. They just don't have the symptoms of it, and don't suffer the uh, or don't suffer the symptoms of it. I should say. Yeah, and it's not something where when we're talking like asymptomatic, this is not like COVID where you are at risk for passing it on to somebody else. If you have asymptomatic Lyme, like you're like we're saying, like a. a a tick's not going to transmit from you to somebody else. So you're not spreading Lyme. You're just, you happen it's not to, doing anything to you. You happen to have it in your system and it's not causing your immune system to go crazy for whatever reason. There's a lot of research still being done on that is what I understand. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're getting into this next part. Uh, Lyme disease. Where are we? Okay. Later on, we're getting into the different subspecies. Okay. Um, so Lyme disease is the number one zoonotic disease in the U.S. And it appears that both displacement and mutation explain its pathogenicity. Yeah, we st studies have shown that there are non-pathogenic Borrelia burgdorferi found in ticks and have established that there's also a normal tick microbiome that provides health to the tick. Uh, male ticks do not feed on blood and do not infect. And there's a citation there. Uh, a non-arthritic variant of Borrelia burgdorferi previously isolated from an Ixidia scapularis larva from upstate New York was infectious but failed to produce arthritis or carditis in laboratory rats and mice. By contrast, pathogenic strain Ixidia scapularis uh, invariably caused arthritis. This variant shows that Borrelia burgdorferi may have originated as a good strain for a normal microbiome in the tick and originally <laughs> caused no disease in animals nor humans. So they were like just the, they were just the rodents' little buddies that lived inside of them before the fall, then, right? Or was it before the flood? I, I can never tell what's before the fall and what's before the flood with AIG. It's always one or the other. Um, <laughs> so, what what was the what in this in the in the good? What was the what was the good that the Borrelia was was doing for the for the rodents? I wonder. I have no idea because aren't they saying that like, I mean, earlier they were trying to say that ticks ate dead things, which I mean, we, we already talked about that, but so I don't, I don't know what new good things they're trying to. Well, they're almost say. look like they're saying like within the, the internal biology, like the microbiome of the, the rodent, like the ecology within its within its biological system was and the, the, these were beneficial, but I don't see, I don't I don't understand what the what benefits they were ex expecting them to present. <laughs> I'm so confused about what their goal is. Well, actually, that's a lie. We know what their goal is with this article. Yeah, I'm confused. About, like we, we learned all of, we learned. I think we learned about COVID nineteen stuff in here before they even got into talking about the the rash. What was the name of the rash yeah. again? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we they we, said, did. we also learned about climate change before that. Yeah, <laughs> there there is there's um, an agenda here. I can yeah. smell it. <laughs> so I'll I'll add my piece after we read this next section because I want to talk about the different uh, species of Borrelia. Mm -hmm. So a uh, mutation of the Borrelia bacteria have added to the complexity of Lyme disease. For a long time, it was believed that one main species caused Lyme disease until uh, Borrelia mayoni was discovered. The life cycle was was found to be similar to that of Borrelia burgdorferi, even having some of the vector, same vector to transmit the disease. Many of the symptoms that are the same as Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, but Borrelia mayoni also causes nausea and vomiting, diffuse rashes instead of a bullseye rash, and a higher concentration of bacteria in the blood. Uh, this is the one that was found 
that I was talking about earlier, the one in Minnesota, uh, Borrelia Mayoni, it's called that way because it was uh, reported, first reported at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, so that's why it's named that way. Um, but I, I want to talk about this because, like I mentioned earlier, you do have some nausea, vomiting, diffuse rashes with uh, certain stages of Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme disease. Uh, they just did not mention that. But then there are also other diseases that aren't even Lyme that are caused by various types of Borrelia. Uh, for example, you have uh, Borrelia recurrentis. Uh, and there's another type as well that cause uh, re uh, relapsing fever. And that's a disease that, I mean, it's characterized by relapsing fever. So you're going to get fever, it's fever is going to go away, you're going to get another fever. And this is a Borrelia illness that is not related to Lyme, it is just relapsing fever. Uh, so Borrelia yeah, can... induced relapsing fever. Well, what? Is it Borrelia induced relapsing fever? Yes, yes, it, it did. It did. And so they're they're trying to say that like I mean they're talking about mutation which is also kind of ironic because we know that they don't believe in evolution. Right. So they're <laughs> and they're, they're, they're being the, careful or about that, this. Uh, that a mutation can cause for the for, so for the Borrelia uh, to say that the, uh, it's a mutation that that causes a positive effect for their uh, propagation is actually goes against everything I've ever heard AIG say about evolution and mutation because mutations according to AIG only are are either neutral or detrimental. There's no mutation mm -hmm. that benefits the organism. So these the fact that this paragraph here begins with mutations of Borrelia have added, or sorry, mutations of the Borrelia bacteria has added to the uh, complexity of Lyme disease uh, in, in giving a positive window for the Borrelia is just ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, so they're just contradicting themselves uh, on what they mean by mutation and, and how they're referring to evolution. Because, like, I mean, this is evolution. We, we see this happening with, like, bacteria are probably some of the best examples of evolution because we can watch them uh, over multiple generations, like thousands of generations in a very short period of time. Especially E. coli. Uh, you know about the citrus or the citrate... Uh... Uh, yes. Experiment with the E. coli because I see E. coli coming up down here in the next paragraph. So, yeah, the 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 way that they ex they decide whether to what mutations to accept and to reject is is very arbitrary on what helps them make their their biblical case. Yeah. So they're just not they're not consistent. Um, I think that's kind of all I really wanted to say about all of this. Do you have anything else about the varying strains of Borrelia? No, I understand that those are different species. And different species are going to cause different reactions in their uh, their hosts. So, no, it's it's pretty pretty straightforward and does not mean Jesus. This next paragraph is fun uh, because we're going back to climate change. <laughs> like other microbes undergoing mutation and variation, we also see this in Lyme disease today. The typical creation model for explaining infectious diseases would include microbe modification and displacement. I would like to add weather change as another major factor that contributes to new emerging and re-emerging cases uh, diseases. Secular science secular scientists would refer to this as climate change. However, I believe it is an exaggeration that man can control global weather on an extended time frame. My own research, and he cites himself twice uh, on, on Giardia and E. coli, uh, showed that these microbes' abundance changed significantly with rainfall that nearly doubled over a three-year period. Beavers, Giardia, E. coli, and other coliforms increased over time as rainfall stirred sediments and habitats changed. Clearly, rainfall influenced abundance of pa potential pathogens. Oh, okay, Giardia hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, they don't mean like beavers, like the mammal, then, right? When they say beaver, because they give you they say beavers, uh, Giardia, or G G is it Giardia and E. coli. So they say beavers. What, what are they talking about? The furry animals here, the furry mammals. I don't know what else they would be talking about. What is what do beavers have to do with? I mean, okay. beavers probably spread disease. Okay. I know there's one disease that is oh. 
now I'm gonna I'm gonna be so mad at myself for not remembering what specific disease is associated with beavers. Uh, the the Rocky Mountain fever or whatever. The oh, it is Giardia, fever. I think. It's be yeah. it's Giardia. So yeah. that's why they're talking about beavers. Okay. okay. So oh, right, I'm, I'm with you now because the the, the okay. rainfall causes causes fluctuations in the beavers' pop. Okay, I get it now. Okay, I get it. Um, in another study, serratia extended. Drought followed by an abundance of rain seemed to lead a new strain of serratia. Uh, I believe that along with habitat change, weather changes have also led to new Lyme disease variants and range expansion. Why? Okay, I am so confused about why they have to be so adamant about not calling it climate change and not admitting that humans can have any, any uh, involvement in this. Because I don't see any... Like even if we're going off of biblical reasoning, they have really there's really no reason to that would indicate that humans cannot cause. It's because that that change. position is is not a a biblical position. It's a capitalist position. Yep. Um, is is what it comes down to because they yep. they already know they already uh, notate in their work that everything that's that that that's diseases and all this stuff is all because we're in a fallen world. So the climate change and the climate being able to be affected by humanity, there's, it, it doesn't go against their model. They can say, yes, climate change, anthropogenic climate change is real and it fits our biblical model because we live in a fallen world and it would have just as much veracity as all this other crap that they're saying. So I don't know why they're sticking to that other than because they have. Yeah. But hold on, hold on a sec because Humans caused the fall, right? So, like, we sinned, right? So, if climate change is a result of sin, then humans did cause it for yeah. eternity, according to them. Because if if all sin, like, is eternal, and, like, the original sin, like, carries over, that's... Oh, my gosh, that's their model. That really is their model, that they're saying that, what, that all climate is, is anthropogenic. So, yeah, all climate change, everything bad is human's fault. Every tornado, every hurricane, every yeah. yeah, every blizzard, it's all anthropogenic because of the fall. So all yeah. Yep. Wow. I wonder so, if we're the first ones to uh to point that out. So they debunked themselves. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> uh anything else about like the beavers and stuff? No, uh I think that uh yeah, the the climate change stuff is is really uh uh, stick it in my craw a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're getting kind of to their, their points of this entire article. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Human animal and environmental health are intricately interwoven and inextricably interrelated and providentially designed. All life on earth is connected by the creator's plan. Secular scientists recognize the connection for the biosphere and call it One Health. Uh, Cohen and Smith, I guess, is who he's quoting there. This is the idea that all three interacting components are connected, and good stewardship recognizes the importance of all things. Now, good stewardship is a biblical concept of that we're supposed to take care of the earth that we live on. Uh, I've, I've actually had to point that out to some people who were like, what difference does it make if this is just the place we wait in before he if this is just heaven's waiting room, what difference does it make if we take care of it? Well, wouldn't you rather heaven's waiting room for future generations, not, not be gross and detrimental to the health of the people living there. Mm -hmm. But I digress. Uh, where was I? Uh, the reason, the reasoning in the, um, let me try that again. The reasoning is that microorganisms and parasites circulate among human hosts, animal hosts, and environmental reservoirs. Changes in the environment can lead to the transmission of pathogens to animals and humans that previously were not exposed to them. That's, I mean, that's just, that's the Anthropocene. That's, or the Holocene anyway, in a nutshell right there about that. I'll digress about that a bit to, uh, after I'm done reading this, it might be helpful to visualize one health as three overlapping spheres. A change in any one of the spheres influences the others as it happens continuously. The mixing of microbes in different animal host displacement and under different environmental conditions can lead to an adapt adaption evolution so-called 
or new and potentially new pathogen and parasites. So we are accepting evolution here, but they want to call it adaptation. This is so ironic. That's why I jumped on this paragraph before you could start reading it because I wanted to read that part because they are okay. saying evolution so-called, evolution so-called is evolution that they just don't like because it, it it's called evolution and they're not supposed to like it. <laughs> but uh, this whole whole paragraph here is... Uh, <laughs> Is, is basically leading up to the to one big uh yeah they evolve and change they use different vectors and different hosts uh and move into different environments and it causes uh, uh genetic changes to them but it's not evolution they're different organisms and react different in, in different in different environments but it's not evolution it's it's ridiculous uh get it together aig Any yeah thought? and one health is great L i love I love the concept of One Health. Uh, my school teaches a lot about this because it's true. It, humans are affected by the world around us and the organisms around us. So uh, if you keep um, the environment uh, in, a, in a good place, then the things living in the environment are going to do better. Uh, human medicine is a lot related to animal medicine. Of course, like zoonotic diseases, if you can uh, take care of other animal populations, then you can reduce human disease. And, and so, yeah, everything is interconnected. And I, I do agree with them that that's great. Um, One Health is a, is a secular idea uh, taught like in, in all areas of science and medicine. And they're just going to chalk this up to like good stewardship and stuff and say, it's, this is a Christian thing, uh, but then also deny evolution in it. And it's, I'm not opposed to good stewardship. If it makes you want to take care of the environment, they can preach that message, but you you have to practice it too. Like yep. when we're talking about climate change, you have to accept the data. You can't just change it to weather change. Weather is not climate. Uh, weather mm -hmm. is, is uh, sequential to uh, very, very short time periods. Climate is over a long, uh, long, long period. <laughs> so if you're going to be a good steward, you need to accept the data as we've discovered. As our science, people spend their lifetimes looking into this. Uh, one of my best friends, Amanda, spent her whole entire life studying climate change, and the data is there. Use it. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely, practice what you preach. If you're going to be a proponent of good stewardship, and you should be, um, if you're religious, that's the preferred thing that you should be. But yeah, take some responsibility for that as well. Um, right. uh, next one. Now we're getting into more COVID. Uh, but first we have this tiny paragraph. I'll finish that up. Ticks okay. need to draw blood from a mammal host that can harbor B. burgendorfi. On the East Coast, that is a common deer or white-footed mouse. In California, that would be... Or that would include deer as well as western gray squirrels, voles, mice none of which live in seaside grasslands. Now I do want to stress that, that uh, in warmer climates, uh, uh, deer tick do seem to prefer reptiles when they're available. So lizards uh, and snakes are um, when, when they're available are the preferred food. So this next part is what really kind of grinds my gears. Um, so they're connecting this with COVID as we know, this was their goal from the beginning. Summers tick season, but with it comes an increased risk of Lyme disease and another tick-borne illness. Uh, just only only one other tick-borne illness. <laughs> Most tick bites are innocuous and do not transmit an infection. In the US, there are 16 different tick-borne diseases according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. CDC. So again, going back to the CDC, but uh, <laughs> they're not gonna accept the CDC with regard to COVID, but they're still <laughs> gonna quote them here. Um, there are a rising number of cases from larger ticks in Northern California, Ixodes uh, pacificus. The CDC estimates that approximately 476,000 Americans are diagnosed treated for Lyme disease each year due to their prolonged heat spells out west. We covered this number already. Um, additionally, diagnosing the disease can be trickier since COVID-19 as some of the symptoms are similar. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, Dr. Amesh Adalja, senior scholar at John Hop Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, said of the symptoms between Lyme disease and COVID-19. 
Both can cause fever, aches, and pains, but each have symptoms that distinguish one from another, such as a bullseye skin rash with Lyme disease. With COVID-19, the flu-like symptoms are generally accompanied by respiratory problems. So they're even admitting that there are differences between Lyme and COVID, but then they're still going to say that, well, it's hard to tell them apart, so uh, I guess COVID's not real. Yeah, at least at least some of those COVID cases are obviously Lyme disease because... Obviously. <laughs> yeah. Now we get to our summary and conclusion here, and I got to say, uh, there's not been any body of, of information for them to have a summary and conclusion section for. There hasn't even been an argument presented. No. Like, I didn't even see an argument being put together. Like, if you were to ask me what their hypothesis was and what their study actually was, I could not tell you because I, I, it's just, it's just word vomit. Yeah. It's just, uh, again, it's just cutting, they take copy and paste of stuff from the CDC with uh, some, Standard AIG talking points about uh, anti-evolution, anti-climate change stuff, just interlaced within it. To you hook them in, hook the people in, or the uh, the students in with the. When I say students, I mean the homeschool students, because I'm still under the very uh, strict impression that all AIG does is uh, try to make homeschool curriculum for people to to teach to their kids. So. Um, yeah. I feel like most of the summary we don't really need to read because a lot of it's well, I mean the first paragraph. Yeah, go ahead. But um the pathological effects derived from Lyme disease are best explained by way of displacement, modification, weather, and habitat changes. Ticks may not have originally been parasitic, but it is widely understood that male ticks do not possess any parasitic function. After the fall Lies. described in Genesis 3. <laughs> I want you you want to address that? Okay, yeah, they're male ticks and female ticks are uh, have three different life life they go from or life cycles they have go from their their neem stage where they both feed on blood to their uh, to their or yeah larval then the neem stage and the nymph stage they both feed on uh, on blood then they molt into the adult stage at which point the female is the only one that feeds on blood but the males already fed on blood and had two big bloody meals. So yeah, that's not true. There you go. After the fall described in Genesis three, deadly diseases, pestilences and plagues have cursed the world and are recorded in ancient history. Because if we can't explain a disease, it obviously must be sin. <laughs> is the rest of this going to be uh, fire? And a lot of this stones? is sim similar. I, I do want to address I this last paragraph, here. because yeah. they're, this is where they're actually making their statements of what they want to happen. They want us to be Christians, because obviously we should repent, because then we won't get Lyme disease. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many Christians get Lyme disease. But AIG, probably a lot. I, AIG probably didn't, didn't present those numbers, because if... Oh, no. It's only the <laughs> secular people. Yeah, it's as though because they're all in the, covered in the blood of Jesus. Same thing that's protecting them all from COVID right now. Yeah. As for ticks, their pre fall good function may have been as decomposers and plant consumers in the environment based upon their similar anatomy and niche with some mites. Their anatomy. Still, <laughs> yeah, it's not the same. Ticks still have a regulatory positive value in ecosystems today. When confronted with debilitating diseases that disrupt the fabric of humanity, those who believe in the Bible must be steadfast and lean on our creator. Romans 8 says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Romans 8.18 as Christians, we do not elude the grip of these futilities subjected onto us by ourselves. We must not live in fear, but rather study the irreducible complexity of our benevolent God's creation and be transformed by the renewal of our minds, Romans 12, 2, trusting in God's perfect will. In the present, we can observe and study the multifaceted complexity and intric intricacy of ticks, bacteria, and ecosystems. Oof. Oof. Um, I, I thought that Romans eight eighteen was uh, 
and the appeal that, that what they were talking about with the uh, but yet to be revealed was that the wasn't that the, the land of Canaan was going to be left to the uh, to the Israelites. I thought that's what that verse was referring I have to. No idea. Junk shop. Are you in the live chat? <laughs> Do we have anyone in the chat have a Bible? Eight eighteen. Some context is eight eighteen about the land of Canaan or about uh, about heaven after after the afterlife or whatever. I think I thought it was always thought it was about Canaan, but I could be wrong. Uh, let's scroll down and look at those references real quick. You want to? Yeah. But also their, their whole, we must not live in fear thing, obviously referring to COVID. Yeah. It's about wearing, wearing masks and social distancing. When was this published? Was this, it's been the last couple of months, wasn't it? This was August 4th of this okay. year. It's new. Okay, so in uh, the references, we have uh, Cosmos Magazine uh, article about ticks. Now, that's not uh, usually on when, when you have references on a on a scientific paper. It's usually not a, a magazine article, but no, you could probably go to that magazine article and uh, find the links or find the sources that they used, and maybe that would be a good paper to cite. But uh, yeah, usually, usually art, magazine articles like this are associated with, with a paper. Like there's probably a paper mm -hmm. out there about ticks and mites, closer relatives than thought that you could go open up and, and, and look at if you, if you went to these references. So um, the rest of this stuff is all what, like CDC stuff. Journal. And they have a journal of microbiology, which like. It's not going to support anything they've said in this article though. I don't oh, know. Yeah. It, it literally just says that there are some some species of Borrelia that are not infectious or that are infectious, but not pathogenic. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. And I think all the rest of it is well, CDC. And then we got, but we got some microbiology. Text. Yep. Two microbiology text. Is, oh, COVID, no. is it COVID or Lyme disease? What's that from tribe trip live.com. Uh, I think that's probably I, that, where they were quoting that doctor from. I bet. Click on it. I bet that's what it is. Or no? You might you know, go ahead and click on it. Yeah. Let's see. Here, let me. Uh, I can share this specific one. We're gonna we're gonna share this. <sighs> Ouch. <laughs> This title. Um, yeah, this is the the doctor that they cited. The one that was the like, overlap. It was like, no, there's differences though. And then they're like, but we're going to ignore those in the entire article. <laughs> oh, it's Lyme disease. Okay. Yeah. I, is it said? There's no rash associated with COVID. No. And this person advised people to get vaccinated for COVID. So at least there's that. Yeah. So I don't think that this is necessarily a, I think they were trying to look for someone for a, so just any kind of paper that would draw a comparison between the two and just went with what yeah. they had, even though when they quoted the person, they're like, yeah, there's differences. <laughs> yeah. The last two um, references that he cited were himself. Right. Um, from that answers the third in Genesis. Time that, and that was the, other the answers second, in Genesis articles that he wrote. Yeah. And that was the third time or second and third time that he cited himself as the source for his information. So mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Alan uh, Gillen is who wrote that. Uh, let me read this real quick. Dr. Gillen spent seven years in a graduate study in zoology and medical microbiology at the Ohio State University, the University of Houston, and Baylor College of Medicine. His focus is on integrating creation themes in bio with biology. He has written three books and two lab manuals on various biology topics. His books include Human Biology and Intelligent Design, Body by Design, Fearfully and Woefully Made, and The Genesis of Germs. His major research interests are dedicating or sorry, detecting water parasites and pathogens in Lynchburg, Virginia area water, describing the origins and genesis of uh, 
uh, Gigardia, uh, Cryptosporidium, and Coliform growth in local water in the carriage of MRSA in Liberty University students. So he, this the research that he's citing here is actually his own research too uh, with that Liberty, Liberty University with the Liberty University stuff. But the rest of the, the rest of those credentials sound freaking amazing, and it upsets me so much that, that someone that knows that much of what he's saying is BS that he's still out there putting it out because you can't go to yeah all those different different university programs and not walk away with a understanding of how biology and virology works. And let me say something here too about that because Liberty University has a medical school which is really scary because if if you're learning a very biased take on biology and you're not getting an accurate foundation of biology, and then you're going into medicine and treating people, I could see why you would be a doctor and not have good information about v vaccines and about COVID. So that's really, really scary. Yeah. Liberty University is, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's, I always thought it was a degree mill uh, when I look at it before, but it, did, did this, did this say he went there? No, he just he just, he just teaches just, there. I think teaches there. But. Okay. Oh wow. Um, so that's the sad thing too is he went and got a real education, and then put it in the just just stuffed it away, and then went and used that the credentials he got from that education to go and teach people misinformation about about very very important medical stuff like disease vectors. This is dangerous stuff that this guy's doing. Yeah, yeah, it's so yeah. dangerous. So, yeah, thanks for reading this with me. I, I know it was very painful to go through. Um, and we actually, we went pretty in depth on a lot of that, uh, yeah. which is pretty nice. We actually rolled almost uh, almost to two hours breaking this sucker yeah. down. So we, we really gave a uh, in-depth view of it. Yeah, and I hope to do more medical myths in the future with lots of guests. Thank you. Brain Bug for being my first guest on this show. And thank you to everybody in the audience for watching. I had a really great time. Um, if you have a medical myth that you want me to debunk on my channel, feel free to message me on Twitter and uh, give me your feedback. I do want to cover, I do want to cover homeopathy at some point. That is going to be one that I do. I think um, I had a request to cover vaginal steaming. That might be the next one. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna go after Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if if you have myths you want me to cover, um, let me know. And thank you all for watching, and we will see you all next time. <laughs>